Welcome everyone. This is part four in our series on methods and metrics. We're going to be talking about how we organize data sets for the purposes of conducting evaluations in NLP. Let's begin with the classic train dev test split. This is a very common format for data sets in our field, especially for the very large publicly available ones. Uh, and it's really good in the sense that in releasing data sets with these splits predefined, we do ensure some consistency across the different evaluations that people run. It does presuppose that you have a fairly large data set because after all, right from the get-go, you are setting aside a whole lot of examples in the dev and test splits that you can't use at all to train your systems. So even though your system might benefit from those examples, you can't use them in that context. They can be used only for evaluations. You're just giving up a lot of potentially useful examples. Uh, as we've discussed many times, we're all on the honor system when it comes to that test set. It's distributed as part of the data set, but it has a privileged status. The test set can be used only once all of system de development is complete. Uh, and then you do a single evaluation on the test set and report that number completely hands off. This is vital for our field because it's the only way that we can even hope to get a true picture of how our systems are truly generalizing to new examples. That said, uh, the downside of having predefined train dev test splits is that inevitably everyone is using those same dev and test sets. And what that means is that over time, as we see consistent progress on a benchmark task, um, we're taking that same measurement on that same test set, and it can be hard to be sure whether we're seeing true progress on the underlying task or the result of a lot of implicit lessons that people have learned about what works and what doesn't for that particular test set. And that's true even if everyone is obeying that honor code and do, using the test set only for truly final evaluations. Nonetheless, information can leak out and we might start to mistake true progress um, when we're actually just seeing progress on that particular test set. And I think the only way that we can really combat this is by continually setting new benchmark tasks for ourselves um, with new test sets so that we see how systems perform in truly unseen environments. As you leave NLP, it's common to find data sets that don't come with that predefined train dev test split, and that poses some methodological questions for you. This is especially true for small public data sets that you see out there. And this poses a challenge for assessment. For robust comparisons, you really have to run all your models using your same assessment regime, that is the same splits. Uh, and that's especially important if the data set is small, because of course, in a small data set, you're probably going to get more variance across different runs. And this can make it really hard to compare outside of the experimental work that you're doing. If someone has published the results of some random 70-30 train test split, um, unless you can reconstruct exactly the splits that they used, it might be unclear whether you're doing a true apples to apples comparison. So that's something to keep in mind. And it does mean that if you can, for your own experiments, you might impose a split right at the start of your project. This is probably feasible if the data set is large. And what it will mean is that you have a simplified experimental setup and you have to do less hyperparameter optimization just because there are fewer moving parts in your underlying experimental setup. It does presuppose that you have a pretty large data set because as I said before, you have to give up a whole bunch of examples to dev and test, but it will simplify other aspects of your project if it's feasible. For small data sets though, imposing a split might leave too little data leading to highly variable performance. And in that context, if that's the kind of behavior that you observe, you might wanna move into the mode of cross-validation. So cross-validation in this context, we take a set of examples, say our entire data set, and we partition them into two or more trained test splits. And you might do that repeatedly and then average over the results of evaluations on those splits in some way to give a holistic summary of system performance. And in that way, even as those numbers vary, they might have a lot of variance, we're still getting in the average, we hope a pretty reliable measure of how the system performs in general on the available data. And I'm gonna talk about two ways to do cross-validation, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. Let's begin with what I've called random splits here. So under the random splits regime, you take your data set and let's say K times, you shuffle it and you split it and you have T percent for train and then probably the rest left out for test. And on each one of those splits, you conduct some kind of evaluation, get back your metrics. And then at the end of all these K evaluations, 
you probably average those metrics in some way to give a single summary uh, number for system performance. In general, but not always, when we do these splits, we want them to be stratified in the sense that, that the train and test splits should have approximately the same distribution over the classes uh, in, in the underlying data. But I've been careful to say that this is not always true. There could, for example, be contexts in which you would like your test set to stress test your system by having a very different distribution, maybe an even distribution, or one that's heavily skewed towards some of the smaller but more important classes. Uh, and that will pose a challenge for train test regimes because the system's experiences at train time will be different in this high level distributional sense from what it sees at test time. But that, of course, might be part of what you're trying to pursue as part of your overall hypothesis. The trade offs for this kind of cross validation the good is that you can create as many splits as you want without having this impact the ratio of training to testing examples, right? Because K times, we're just going to do a random split, and it can be consistent that we do, independent of K, 70% train, 30% test, or 50-50, or whatever we decide we want, um, that's independent of the number of splits that we set. The bad of this, of course, is that there's no guarantee that every example will be used the same number of times for training and for testing. And for small data sets, this, this could, of course, be a concern because you might be introducing unwanted correlations across the splits uh, and, for example, never having certain hard examples be part of your test set just as a matter of chance. So that's something to keep in mind. But of course, for very large data sets, it's very unlikely that you'll be susceptible to the bad part of this. And then you do get a lot of the benefits of the freedom of being able to run lots of experiments with a fixed train test ratio. And of course, as usual, Scikit uh, has a lot of tools to help you with this. So I've just given some classic examples down here from the model selection package. You might import shuffle split, stratified shuffle split, and of course, train test split is a useful utility for very quickly and flexibly creating splits of your data. And I make heavy use of these throughout my own code. The second regime for cross-validation that I'd like to discuss is k-folds cross-validation. Here, the method is slightly different. We're going to take our data set and split it into three folds, in this case for three-fold cross-validation. You could, of course, pick any fold number that you wanted. And then given that it's three-fold cross-validation, we're going to conduct three experiments. One where fold one is used for testing, and two and three are merged together for training. A second experiment where we hold out fold two for testing, and the union of one and three is used for training. And then finally, a third experiment where fold three is used for testing, and folds one and two are concatenated for the train set. The trade-offs here are slightly different from the trade-offs for random splits. So the good of this is that every example appears in a train set exactly k minus one times and in a test set exactly once. We have that guarantee in virtue of the fact that we use a single split over here to conduct our three experimental paradigms. The bad of this, of course, can be really difficult. The size of K is determining the size of the train test split, right? Just consider that for three-fold cross-validation, we're going to use 67% of the data for training and 33 for testing. But if three experiments is not enough, if we want 10 folds, the result of that will be that we use 90% of our data for training and 10% for testing. And the bottom line is that those are very different experimental scenarios from the point of view of the amount of training data that your system has and probably the variance that you see in testing because of the way you're changing the size of the test set. Whereas for the random splits that we just discussed, we have an independence of the number of folds and the, the percentage of trained test examples that we're going to have. And that can be very freeing, especially for large data sets where the value up here in the good is really less pressing. And again, Scikit-Learn has lots of tools for this. I've actually just given a sample of them here. You have k-fold, stratified k-fold, and then cross -file score is a nice wrapper utility that will again give you flexible access to lots of different ways of conceptualizing k-folds cross-validation.